Now, and I don't think I've heard you do a solo before. I know you sing, but singing in a choir and singing that's a different thing. So thank you. As I said a couple weeks ago, God bless you. We're reading from the New Testament book of the Philippians this morning, reading chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. If you've been in the church for a while, a lot of this is going to sound familiar. Let us hear God's word. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others." In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself By becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore... My dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, how many of you have ever put Ikea furniture together (laughs) or some other, some assembly required kind of furniture. Okay, this is, this is a good start today. This next question is mostly for the men, but if it applies to you as a woman, then put your hand, please, because this is important. So how many of us have put Ikea furniture together on our own when it clearly is a job for two people? Oh, good. There are some women that have done that too. I feel so much better about myself. Thank you. When we were preparing to bring Sakna into our home, our daughter, uh, we needed another bedroom. And we had a fairly large family room, so we lopped off a third of it, put a wall up, and made a bedroom there. And we moved Curtis, our eldest, down into in that room. The oldest always gets, always gets the downstairs bedroom, right? So we moved Kurt into there. But we wanted to leave things so that they could be returned to a large family room. So we didn't uh, put in a built-in closet or anything like that. We instead bought an Ikea wardrobe. One day, I, like I'm a, I'm a reasonably handy guy, so I started putting it together when Grace was out of the house. And I very quickly realized that this was a two-person job. So I stopped and waited for Grace to come home right? No. No, I kept going. This is like, this is a, I'm going to do this. So I kept on putting it together. Grace came home just as I was wrestling with this thing that was about this wide, just wrestling with it to get it upright for the next step, but it wasn't as stable as it ought to have been at that point in time. So my wrestling kind of ruined one of the joints on top, and the particle board top that was about this big by this big and about this thick fell right on the top of my head. 
Now, Grace's sympathy lasted long enough to make sure I wasn't going to die that moment. <laughs> and then very gently in her manner inquired as to why I hadn't waited for her assistance. At least I'm pretty sure she didn't call me stupid. But I probably had a concussion, so I don't know for sure. <laughs> Have any of you ever tried to do a two-person job all on your own? What happens when you try to do alone that which requires the participation of another? I want you to keep an example in the back of your mind about doing a two-person job on your own. This is the fourth and last message in our series on the Holy Spirit and the work of the Spirit in our lives, and it is the second of the, the subsection that is, that is looking at the work of the Holy Spirit transforming us to make us holy, to set us apart for God's own purposes. We saw last week that this, this process of being made holy is called sanctification, being set apart for God's special purposes. If you weren't here last week, it would probably be helpful to go to the website and check out that sermon because these two do kind of go together as a set. Now, our passage today is from the book of Philippians. Paul wrote a letter to the church in Philippi. This is the warmest and most joy-filled letter uh, of Paul's that we have in the Bible. Paul's relationship with this church uh, that he had established was close and loving. And there was, there was a special thing to it because it was in Macedonia, and, and Paul had had a dream about going to Macedonia. So there was just a really great relationship with these people. On top of that, at the time of writing this letter, Paul was in prison. One of the times he was in prison because of his faith, because he was sharing the good news about Jesus. And so the Philippian church got together an offering to give Paul a gift to support him while he was in prison. And this letter is what he wrote in response to all of that. Now, our passage today celebrates all that Jesus Christ is and all that he did to save us from our sins. It also calls the church, the Philippians, as well as us, not only to receive God's grace in Jesus for salvation, but also to follow Jesus' example, the example of his own life. Now, I want to be clear on this. There are lots of people in the world who say we should follow Jesus' example, and that is true. But Jesus is not merely an example to be followed. Jesus is Savior and he is Lord, and in his self-sacrifice on the cross, he forgives us and he saves us. So whenever I talk about following Jesus as an example, it's in the context of salvation in Jesus, of, of receiving Jesus as Savior, as living with him as Lord. In that place, we are to follow Jesus as an example. We read together. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Even here at the opening of this passage, Paul puts salvation and relationship with Christ before calling the people to follow his example. And what is the example? Well, it includes Jesus' act of salvation. And Paul quotes what was almost certainly a first century hymn. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ. That's his introduction. 
who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Within Jesus' act of salvation, we find this amazing example of profound humility. Humility to the point of freely accepting humiliation. The hymn proclaims Jesus' humility. It proclaims Jesus' sacrifice, and it proclaims Jesus' glory, the glory that God the Father gave to Jesus. Then we come to the verses on which we are focusing today. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Paul began with therefore. That connects with what he is about to say with what he had just said. And what did he just say? He just talked about Jesus humbling himself. He talked about Jesus sacrificing himself. He talked about God the Father glorifying Jesus. Therefore, he went on to, to celebrate the obedience of the Philippian church. They were obedient to God. But the therefore connects what he wrote about Jesus to this command he was about to give. Jesus humbled himself. He sacrificed himself. He was glorified. Therefore, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. There are three parts to this, so we're going to look at three parts, but we're going to look at them in reverse order just to be tricky today. With fear and trembling, this is not about nervousness and anxiety. This is not about terror and doom. In Psalm 111, we read, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. To fear the Lord is to have reverence for the Lord. It is to have a deep and abiding respect for the Lord. It is to acknowledge that God is God and I am not. It is to acknowledge that God is creator and we are the created. It is to acknowledge that God is savior in Jesus and we are the ones who are saved. It is to acknowledge that God is Lord and we are his subjects. Fear and trembling is reverence and humility. Work out your salvation in fear and trembling. Work out your salvation with reverence and humility. Work out your salvation. Paul wrote in Ephesians, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast. Paul is clear in all of his writings that salvation is in Christ alone. Salvation is by the grace of God in Jesus alone. Salvation is through faith in Jesus alone. Paul is clear in everything he writes. So this passage really stands out. What does it mean to work out your salvation if it is all about God's grace in Jesus? 
work out your salvation. On the surface, it sounds like we are to work to achieve our salvation, but that would be in opposition to everything else that Paul wrote. Our faith is supposed to show in our lives. What we do reveals our salvation. What we say discloses our salvation. It is not about doing works to achieve salvation. It is from the salvation that God gives us in Jesus. We work from that place of salvation. We work out of our salvation to honor the Lord. Work out your salvation in fear and trembling, but that's not, that's not the end of it. There is more. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. The Holy Spirit works in us, transforming us for God's good purpose. That sounds an awful lot like sanctification. Now, last week, I asked you if you have seen changes and continue to see changes in your life, changes to your character, growth in your faith, and growth in your awareness of the Lord. And that if we don't see any changes, if we don't see growth, then we need to be more open to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And that's what we find here in this passage. Work out your salvation because the Holy Spirit is working in you for God's purposes. We see here why sanctification is a difficult concept. Not only is it probably the churchiest word that exists that people just don't know, but it is also a little bit paradoxical. Because it is the blending together of the almighty, sovereign power of the holy God. Now, just think that. The almighty. This is, this is omnipotence for those who work in those words. This is the greatness, the awesomeness, the full and complete power of the living God who is Lord of all, mixing that up with human freedom. It's a little complicated. It's a little tough. God does not force himself upon us. I say this frequently, but he offers himself to us so that we should receive him and be open to all he would do in us and all he would do with us for his good purposes, for us to be the best us we can be for us to be all he would have us be. God makes us holy by the work of his Holy Spirit in our lives, but we have a role to play. Work out your salvation. And that role is for us to be open to him, to the transformation that he wants for us and then to live that transformation day by day. So as I asked last week for you to do some work at home, to look at your growth over time, to see if there have been changes in your character, growth in your faith, and a deepening awareness of the Lord, In this passage, we discover that the process of being made holy is a two-person job. God and me, the Holy Spirit and me. God and you, the Holy Spirit and you. How are you at being open to the Spirit of God working in your life to bring transformation? Too often, I think that we are like me putting together the Ikea wardrobe. I can do it on my own. 
I am going to do it on my own. And then we discover it's not working, me doing it on my own. Do you not see that as part of your faith life, at least at times? You want to trust the Lord more, so you try harder. You want to be more obedient to God, so you try harder. You want to grow as a follower of Jesus, and so you try harder. How's that working out for you? How's that trying harder working out for you in all of those aspects of the growth of our faith? Yeah, me too. Sanctification, being made holy, being transformed by the Holy Spirit for God's good purposes involves the Spirit transforming us. It also involves, our, it involves us, but it is not about us trying harder. At various points in my life, I have tried harder tried harder to love God with everything I am and with everything I have, tried harder to love others in the same way that I love myself, tried harder to fight temptation, tried harder to be more faithful in prayer. And when I try harder, it usually works for a time, but then I get tired or distracted or the the burdens of life come crashing down and I have nothing nothing with which I can then try harder. And I'm right back where I started. So what's the answer? If God wants to partner with us for our sanctification, to make us holy, what is our role in that if it is not to try harder? Our role is to surrender to him, to surrender our lives to him, to surrender our wills to him, to surrender everything to him. Now, unfortunately, at least for me, this is not a one and done proposition. It's not Lord, I surrender everything to you, take it, and now I'm 99% sanctified, just waiting for Jesus to return. It doesn't work that way, at least for me. See, God's not trying to conquer us. So when we surrender to him, he doesn't take us prisoner. We're still free. And we're still free to take back everything we surrender to him and take control again for ourselves. And do we not do that? We surrender our lives to God, and then 12 hours later, we're pulling it back. So what do we do? What do we do if after we have surrendered, we take control back again? Well, we surrender again. And we surrender again. And we surrender again. We surrender everything and we surrender everything to him every day. Look at it this way. Every morning when you wake up, surrender everything that is you for that day to the Lord. And you have to be specific. I find in my faith life when I say, Lord, I surrender it all to you, I go through the day not really remember having surrendered much at all. And it's so easy to start taking it all back. So in the morning when we rise, let us surrender to the Lord, but let us be specific. Lord, today I surrender to you my will. I surrender to you my insecurities. I surrender to you my anger. I surrender to you my interactions with particular people and list those particular people. 
I surrender to you my attitude. I surrender to you my sexuality. I surrender to you my work. I surrender to you my money and its use, my time and its use. I surrender to you my character and my health and my abilities and my inabilities. Lord, I surrender to you those things I can't do. I surrender to you my interactions with my kids. I surrender to you my interactions with my parents. What do you need to surrender to the Lord? What do you need to surrender to God every day? And if your thought is, no, not that, then yes, that. Really. You don't know how much I've been preaching this to myself since writing it on Friday. Yes, we need to surrender that to the Lord. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, with reverence and humility. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Sanctification is a two-person job. God and you. The Spirit and you. The Holy Spirit and me. Let us surrender to him and allow him to do in us and with us all he would for his glory, for our own good, and for the blessing of those around us. Let's pray together. Our holy, loving God, we thank you for the salvation that you give us in Jesus. We thank you for this incredible hymn in Philippians that proclaims the the extent to which you went to save us, the profound humility and incredible humiliation Jesus took upon himself for us. And humbling himself to the point of death, even death on a cross for our forgiveness, for our salvation. We thank you for the grace that you give us in him. That you redeem us, you save us by faith because of your grace in Jesus. But we thank you also for the incredible example that Jesus is to us. To help us to know how to live out our faith, to help us to know how to work out our salvation. Lord, we pray that you would help us to surrender to you. Help us to surrender our lives, our wills, all that is us. So God, in the quiet of this time, each of us in our own way, silently surrender ourselves to you. Surrender each part of us to you. Lord, help us to be aware of our need to surrender ourselves to you. And help us to even, help us to surrender even those aspects of our lives that we just so want to maintain control over. And in that surrender, Lord, transform us that we should live for you. We pray, Lord, for this world, a world that needs to hear about the good news of Jesus, 
a world that needs to hear that good news from people who express and live out your love, who express and live out your grace and mercy and compassion. Lord, use us to share the good news about Jesus in this world and in this city. Lord, we pray for opportunity to speak about Jesus. We pray for opportunity to share his impact upon our lives. We pray for the courage to proclaim, to speak, to share with those around us. We pray your grace and blessing upon St. Paul's as we continue to be a beacon of your grace on Woodruff near the Queensway. Bless us as a church, Lord, to be faithful to you, to stand with you, to proclaim you and your goodness. And we pray for the search that is ongoing for new staff. We pray that your will would be done. We pray that it would be done in your timing and not ours. And we pray that it would be done for your glory and for the great blessing of the people that are St. Paul's. And Lord, this day in, in leaving, we pray your grace and blessing upon Tyler. We pray that uh, he would know that our love and our care go with him. And we pray that you would encourage him and strengthen him and use him powerfully in his new ministry. And Lord, we pray your grace and blessing upon Jeremy. We thank you for both of these guys and the ministry that they have brought to us. And we pray that you would bless Jeremy with the knowledge of our love that goes with him. Uh, bless him in all that he does. Use him powerfully uh, to the ministry uh, to which you call him. And Lord, we pray your blessing upon Amanda and Nevaeh and Zeke that, uh, that you would go with them with great love, that they would know the love of this people for them and that you would support and uphold them as well. Bless us all as your people, Lord. Bless us uh, to be able to say goodbye well and to do this for your glory because we know that you are involved in the midst of all of this. And we pray it, Lord. We pray all of this for your glory's sake. And we pray it in Jesus Christ. Amen.